Steve Jobs. Uh, it is 10 o'clock. Um, so uh, uh, this is the first of three uh, uh, lectures on Bergen spaces offered to us by Stefan Richter at the University of Tennessee. Um, so why don't we just jump in? So Stefan. All right, well, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, uh, setting up this uh, great program this fall and uh, for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, as I started um, thinking about, uh, you know, what I, uh, I was going to talk about, I, uh, I realized that I hadn't actually uh, worked on the Bergman space for about 15 years. And so I went to MathSciNet to see whether I had missed anything in these 15 years. And so here's what I came up with. So I, um, I typed in a Bergman space and Bergman kernel, and I came up with 6,008 papers that had been um, uh, published on uh, containing these words. And let's see, what um, when did all this happen? So uh, uh, there we can see the annual distribution. Um, Bergman wrote uh, the first paper uh, in 1933, and, um, and then in the, uh, Masanya started indexing papers in 1940. So in the beginning, people were uh, mentioning Bergman and his kernel, and so there were a few papers a year. Then this slowly increases, and then in the 1990s, it reaches about 100 papers a year. And then um, uh, in the 15 years that I didn't work on this anymore, it uh, started averaging about 200 papers a year. And, um, and even since I ex accepted the invitation to give these talks, roughly 300 papers have been written. So, um, so what is all this about? All right, so you can see that uh, according to MathSciNet, um, many of these papers are in operator theory. Many of them are in several complex variables and uh, analytic uh, spaces. Um, and then uh, if functions of a single complex variable and functional analysis seem to be more, more general ones. And uh, I don't know, I guess maybe there must be a lot of papers that uh, don't have a primary classification. But in any case, so what Bergman had done uh, was he showed that um, the Bergman kernel and, uh, and the conformal map from one region onto another uh, are related to one another. And that works in one uh, variable and it works in several complex variables. And it's especially important in several complex variables where it, it is harder to construct the conformal mappings between uh, regions in CN. And so that's why there's a lot of papers in several complex variables. So in my talks, I will just focus on uh, operator theory and function theory in the open unit disk. And even in the open unit disk, there's a wide variety of topics that I could have chosen to talk about. And I don't have time to cover all of these uh, if I want to say something substantial. So I, um, today we will talk about reproducing kernels and pointwise estimates of functions in these Bergman spaces, the Bergman projection and duality in the case from P between one and infinity, zero sets. And then tomorrow we'll talk about um, the invariant subspace problem and uh, what it has to do with the Bergman space subspaces of infinite index. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about Bergman inner functions, LP theorems, and uh, Shimoran's approach for uh, the L2 situation. And the goal is to show you some of the different flavors of the Bergman space theory. There's function theory, there's operator theory, and there's all kinds of things coming in. All right, here's a few references. It started with Bergman's paper in 1933, I already mentioned that. A classic on reproducing kernels is, uh, that's still uh, uh, a good read, is uh, Arrangen's paper from 1950. Um, Sheldon Exler's uh, overview paper from 1988 is also an excellent uh, uh, resource. And uh, in, in fact, uh, when I was a graduate student, I was privileged to listen to three lectures by Sheldon on, on Bergman's basis. And, uh, I have benefited from it uh, very much. And so I recommend that. That uh, covers material that was uh, done in the 1980s and before. Uh, and then uh, in the early 2000s, we have uh, three textbooks here, by one by Hakon Hiddenbaum, Boris Kornblum, Kerry Zhu, one by Peter Bdurn and Alexander Schuster, 
and uh, then a later book by Kei Zhu, which covers uh, other material also. All right, so in my talks, we'll be talking about the Bergman spaces of the disk. So P will be an index between zero and infinity, and uh, dA will denote uh, area measure, dx dy, and dA over pi is the normalized area measure. So we take uh, the, the LP a norm, I'll call it, of a function for P less than uh, one, that's not a norm, but that we'll still call it a norm. Um, and then we can do a change of variables using polar coordinates, and we see that uh, the LPA norm is uh, sort of a dr integral of the integral means, uh, the pth integral means of the functions. So if you recall that the HP norm is defined to be the supremum of these integral means, and in fact, these, one can show it's a theorem of Hardy's that these integral means are non-decreasing as a function of r, and the HP norm is this supremum, then you immediately see that uh, HP is contained in LP for each index, and you have the contractive norm inequality that the LPA norm is less than the supremum of this. So analytic functions that satisfy that. Now, um, this inequality was so easy to obtain, it's not the optimal inequality. So these spaces get smaller as p increases, and it turns out that you can um, use estimates of hard, classical estimates of Hardy and Littlewood to prove that HP is actually contained in L2PA. And you get the contractive uh, norm inequality that you get exact equalities to, uh, was observed by Vukotic in 2003. And what he is proof is uh, the following. So he says for P equals two, what you can do is you can notice that the four norm in, in the Bergman space is actually equal to the square root of the two norm of the square of the function. And then you can write it out as a power series and do a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And um, you get it's less than, um, uh, than the uh, H2 norm of the function. All right, you can also uh, then from uh, the situation at P equals two, you get the other values of P just by using inner outer factorizations and uh, P roots and so on. All right, well, on the other hand, these LP spaces are very much larger than uh, than the Hardy spaces. So we, we learned that in the Hardy spaces, every function has non-tangential limits almost everywhere. And uh, that was actually very important for uh, the theory and any of, most of the theorems that you prove about Hardy space functions. And so unfortunately, um, even when you take the intersection of all the Bergman spaces, there are functions that have no tangential limits almost uh, anywhere. Um, so a function that you can take is uh, the summation of z to the 2 to the n. So it's a lacunary series. That means you um, uh, skip a lot. You have a lot of the power series coefficients are 0. And then uh, it's well known that those functions have um, very bad boundary behavior. And Zygmunt showed that uh, this function has radial limits almost nowhere. And uh, on the other hand, you see immediately that if you take the sum of the squares of the power series coefficients, this, they're not square summable because um, they're, they're all one. On the other hand, when you do the LPA norm, you have a triangle inequality there uh, for P bigger than one, that is. And then when you integrate over the disk, the, the Z to the uh, K is, uh, is less than, strictly less than one, and you, you can do the integral exactly and uh, it just turns out that you can rig it with the two to the n here. You can see that it is always finite, uh, no matter what. So there's your function that doesn't have radial limits anywhere. All right, there's another difference between the uh, Bergman spaces and the uh, uh, H2 situation that's very significant. Namely, in H2, you use a lot of times that H2 is contained in the L2. And if you think of the, um, Fourier coefficients of uh, L2 functions and H2 functions, you realize that the author complement of H2 in L2 is sort of like a copy of, um, of H2 itself. These are the complex conjugates of the H2 functions that are zero at the origin. On the other hand, L2, the whole 
space L2 is still the direct sum of L2A and its author complement, but the complex conjugates of the Berg analytic functions in the Bergman space are much, much smaller than this author complement. And so that frequently uh, makes up a big difference in the theory. And in particular, I want to mention that uh, when you look at these powers of uh, z bar to the n and z to the m, by the stone weierstrass theorem, uh, linear combinations of those are, of course, dense in, in L2 of the disk, but uh, they're not orthogonal, and so you can't work with those functions as nicely as you can work with, uh, with the single powers in, in the circle situation. All right, so first a uh, good theorem about the um, LP spaces is that the polynomials are dense. And uh, you can prove that by just looking at the dilation. So you define a function f sub r, say f sub r of z is f sub r of z. And since those functions are analytic in the neighborhood of the closed disk, and those functions can be approximated uniformly by polynomials, it's enough to show that f r converges to f in the LP norm. Um, and then, of course, a simple change of variables uh, shows you that the f r norm, the, the p norm of f r, it converted into the p norm of, um, of f by just doing that simple change of variables with the rz equals w. And if p is bigger than 1, then you're done immediately because now you can use uh, weak convergence and uh, say that a sub, there's some kind of convex combinations of these f sub r's that will converge in norm to f. Uh, if p is less than 1, then you actually need to work a little bit harder, but uh, that's still not much harder. There's a uh, real analysis exercise that says that if you have a sequence of functions that converges almost everywhere, and if the norms converge in LP, then you have actually LP convergence. All right, so that shows that the polynomials are dense. Now, if P is equal to 2, then you can express the Bergman norm, and Tom has already mentioned that, in terms of the Taylor coefficients. So you have the sum of the squares of the Taylor coefficients, and you need to divide it by n plus 1. Um, that's a Hilbert space. L2a is a Hilbert space with inner product uh, then uh, by polarizing this expression. And you can now look at the partial sums of the functions f. So the partial sum just goes from uh, 0 to capital N. And if you subtract that from f, then you see that uh, you just get the tail end of this, uh, this series here. And obviously, the tail end of a convergent series converges to 0. So in in the p equals 2 situation, the partial sums converge to, to f. And it turns out that that's true for all p strictly bigger than 1 and less than infinity. And the proof of that fact, uh, you can actually use the fact that that's, uh, that you can use a Zeger projection, marcel rhesus theorem, that the Zeger projection is bounded on LP if LP is bigger than 1. And then again, you use the fact that you can use polar coordinates to do this integral and you work with the um, boundedness of the um, SNs for the, uh, for the HP situation. That turns out to be, the analog of this turns out to be false uh, if P is equal to 1 or P is less than 1. Okay, Zhu has described that in his article 1991. Um, there's a recent paper where people work on questions of the type, well, let's say F is in um, LP P bigger than 1, can you get the partial sums in L1 to converge to 0 in that case, or some weighted Bergman space or something like that. All right, well, if you want to get away from the Hardy space uh, 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 results, then uh, the best uh, method we have is to use change of variables. So we define the disk automorphism phi lambda of z, lambda minus z over 1 minus lambda bar z. Uh, this has the property that it, it's own inverse and it interchanges uh, zero and lambda. And uh, then, of course, the Jacobian determinant of uh, this uh, function phi lambda is just the absolute value of phi prime squared. And when you do the calculation, what you get is one minus absolute lambda squared squared over one minus lambda bar z to the fourth dA. And if you're like me, you constantly get confused with uh, whether you're supposed to be using the function or its inverse. That's the nice thing about this function. It's its own inverse. So when you change from z to w or w to z, it doesn't matter. You get the same factor here. 
All right. An immediate corollary is that when you take any p between zero and infinity and any lambda in the disk, then this operator v, which depends on p and lambda, uh, where you take f, you compose with phi lambda and multiply it by the derivative to the two over pth power. So the derivative of by the two over pth power is written out over here. Then that's isometric in from LP to LP. So if you take the pth power on both sides, you see you get the F um, composed with phi lambda to the P. And uh, you take the pth power of this, absolute values, you get uh, the term that you need for the change of variables. And so that's isometric on uh, LP for any value of P. Notice what, when you plug in Z equals zero, VF at zero is uh, F of lambda. And then over here, you get uh, this factor uh, one minus absolute lambda squared to the two over p. So if you raise it to the pth power, you get what I have down here. So with that, you immediately get uh, a pointwise estimate for the growth of uh, functions in the Bergman space. And I say it's folklore. Folklore is for when you uh, have uh, one minus absolute lambda quantity squared times f to the p. Uh, when you put the square here, you get the exact estimate um, that's uh, observed by Vukotic, uh, perhaps by other people too, but uh, that's a reference we have. And what you do is you prove this first for lambda equals zero. Uh, so f of zero is less than this. And then you, for that, you can use the integral means as I used on my first slide again. And uh, then once you have that, uh, you can use this operator v that I just talked about. And you immediately get that because v is uh, isometry you immediately get this result. And it's sharp because uh, it's sharp for lambda equals zero. And then we've just transported this. So there's always a function where equality holds. Well, it's sharp, but can you do better? So it's sharp when we fix the lambda and change the f. But uh, we can also do it the other way around. We can fix the f and change the lambda. So as we go with a lambda to one, then this estimate, which was a big O, actually turns into a little O condition. And that's a standard fact in, in many spaces of functions when the polynomials are dense. So what you do is you look at the limb soup of this, and you notice because uh, we have this F sub R available, these um, dilation functions, well, they're analytic in a neighborhood. So when I take the limb soup as lambda goes to one, the F sub R is bounded. So this doesn't change the limb soup here. But now I have the estimate from the previous slide that uh, I can apply f minus fr. And so I get the norm here. And I can make this less than epsilon for any epsilon. So that means that limb soup would have to be zero. So all right, so surely that's the best estimate that can, you can do. Uh, but again, now dependent on what it is you're looking for, if you, you can uh, relax this some more. So if you want to take a non-tangential limit instead of uh, the unrestricted limit here, and you fix a point, almost every point on the boundary, then you can actually reduce the power here by one. So you get, instead of multiplying by a square of this, you multiply by just the first power, which is much larger, and you still get zero almost everywhere. All right, so here's the proof of that. Um, so you write down this function, g sub lambda of z. Um, so there's an f of z in here. And then it has this factor, which again is analytic because uh, the lambda is less than one and I can take a p two over p root for it. And now notice if I plug in lambda in this expression, I get uh, the one over p and the two over p leave me with a one over p power in the denominator. So when I multiply it with, uh, you know, I raise it to the p power and I multiply it with a square, I just get a first power left. So I get to one minus absolute lambda squared f to the p at lambda equals this thing with the square at the g. And now for the g, I can use the first estimate again, the pointwise estimate, the Vukumic uh, estimate, to get it less than the norm. And now we write out uh, the expression that we have here. All right, so we have a Poisson kernel. And then over here, we have a measure that's supported on the disk. So if you have a measure that's supported on the boundary, you know the Poisson integral gives you the absolute value uh, of the, I mean, the uh, absolutely continuous part of the, the measure. Now, if you have a measure in the disk, 
then you can show that this converges to zero almost everywhere. And I learned that from uh, Creed and Trent uh, from a paper. All right, now this, this uh, better estimate is significant because uh, that's uh, the best you can do uh, because you can almost get a converse there. So if you have uh, a power that's uh, slightly less than one in front of the f to the p, then uh, because uh, one over that expression is integrable with respect to area measure, then the function will be an LP. So if you have any holomorphic function that satisfies an estimate where the, the power is just a little bit uh, less than this, then the function has to be an LP. All right, so, so much about uh, the estimates on the boundary. There's one more thing that uh, sort of is in line with the last thing that I just said. That if you, this is the theorem that I do know, that if you have a function in the L2 Bergman space, you can factor it as an H2 function that has the same norm as the Bergman function, an outer function, in fact, and a function that satisfies this better growth estimate um, with less than or equal to one. So as I was uh, uh, thinking about my talk, uh, I know how to prove this using uh, Hilbert space and reproducing kernel methods. And I'm sure other people were aware of this also, uh, that one can do that. Uh, but I'm, I'm not aware, um, I didn't know whether one can do this for uh, general LP functions. So the analog of this for LP would be, can you find HP functions of the same norm or uh, comparable norm to the uh, LP norm of, of the F? And uh, that satisfies this better growth estimate. So if you get bored with my talk, uh, you can work on that, or maybe you know the answer to this, and then you can let me know. If p is equal to 1, then in fact I do know the answer to this. Uh, Hor Horowitz proved that every L1 function, L1a function, is a product of two L2 functions, and then you can use the, the Hilbert space result up here to, to prove this analog. Um, if uh, p is anything else, then, then I don't know. There are results of Conan Verbitsky, uh, where they consider functions whose derivative is in HP. And they prove that, uh, say, any function that whose first derivative is in HP can be written as an HP function times a derivative of a BMO function. And so that may be uh, related to this, but uh, I'm, I'm not aware of this result. But it seems uh, reasonable in light of the previous uh, results that I mentioned. In fact, you might get that uh, you get a little O condition here as uh, lambda goes to one uh, almost everywhere at least because for p equals two the previous results would imply that all right so then when you work in the bergman space uh, the first uh, sort of non-pleasant calculation that you come up with uh, that you come again up against is uh, uh, this kind of expression here so these are functions um, uh, as functions of w, let's say we're fixing a lambda in the disk, and we have two parameters here, t and s. t is uh, bigger than negative 1, and we're integrating uh, expression in, in w, so the t here being bigger than negative 1 means that the measure 1 minus w squared to the t dA is a finite measure. And then um, we're taking a product of uh, the terms with the t and the, uh, with the w and the lambda, and you take in the denominator, you get this uh, mixed term here where you have the power uh, t plus s plus 2. And uh, then when, uh, when this is uh, bounded, then uh, I, I mean, this is bounded independently of, uh, of lambda in, in the disk. So when uh, t is 0 and um, s is 2, then actually you get uh, uh, just again with, against the change of variable formula and you get the expression is equal to one for all lambdas. And, uh, but in general you, you get this. So um, there's two proofs that I know of. Uh, uh, Ferrelli and Rudin uh, did a calculation for, they needed the CD version of this. So you get a D plus one instead of a two here. And they use power series. So you have a binomial expression here and um, you get uh, um, uh, expand the top in the binomial series. You have uh, gamma functions and Stirling's formula and all that, and you can you can get this. Um, when you do the disk, there's an argument by Shields and Williams, which uh, is a little more straightforward. Uh, basically, you again use the Pollock 
coordinate uh, calculation and uh, you first do the d theta integral you use one of these powers here in the denominator and then uh, you get to the rdr integral and now if uh, t is uh, bigger than zero uh, there's no problem here at all but if p is between negative one and zero and that's a case you actually need a lot of times um, then you can do uh, integration by parts one time and that uh, increases the t here um, there's a term that uh, is a non-integrated term that's uh, benign because now the t plus one is bigger than zero and uh, you get uh, you get an estimate of uh, of this type here with the t plus one you have to take a derivative on the denominator so you increase there but now you can use the uh, fact that the one minus r is less than uh, one minus r lambda uh, because t plus one is a positive power then you can cancel that and um, you get this estimate so so you get this uh, i won't actually need that uh, but uh, this uh, estimate is useful in the background uh, frequently. All right, so uh, then the reproducing kernel property, anytime you have an L2 A function, uh, you get this uh, reproducing property that the F of lambda is the F of Z uh, integrated against this. And again, you can verify it for uh, lambda equals zero. It's just the mean value property. And then you use a change of variables. So we'll call this, uh, function k sub lambda, the reproducing kernel, and we get this uh, nifty formula that f of lambda is the integral f against k lambda. All right, so for any L1 function, analytic or not, then you can define the Bergman projection, pf of z, and uh, it's it, the inner product of f with k lambda if you want, but f is an L1 here. So for example, if you calculate the Bergman projection of these monomials, z bar to the n, z to the k. Um, you get this expression here, um, not necessarily very pretty, um, but uh, this uh, Bergman projection has this nice uh, property that uh, when p is equal to 2, I mean the index is equal to 2, then the Bergman projection acts as the orthogonal projection on, on the Hilbert space. So L2a is a closed subspace of L2a, and so there's an orthogonal projection and that's just given by this operator. Um, when p is between one and inf infinity, then it turns out uh, this Bergman projection takes LP functions to LP functions. So that was proven in 1964 by Zahar Yuta and Yudovich, and uh, they used the um, singular integral operator theory uh, to do that. And then later, uh, Forelli and Rudin, oh, sorry, Forelli and Rudin uh, Prove this for uh, uh, in dimension d bigger than one, and they use this uh, estimate that I had earlier there with the um, functions of maximal growth and the sure test to, to prove that. That's the proof that uh, you will find in the textbooks now. So the Bergman projection is not bounded on L infinity or L1. So for example, you can take this function one minus absolute z squared over one minus c. That function obviously is an L infinity, and a simple calculation shows that uh, the Bergman projection of this has a logarithm in there, and that's an unbounded function. And so once you know that it's not bounded from L infinity to, to L infinity, uh, then you can see that it's not cannot be bounded on L1 either, because if it were bounded on L1, then its adjoint would be a bounded operator on L infinity, and then you can prove that uh, th that adjoint would have to be the uh, Bergman projection on L infinity, which is unbounded. All right, so then the LPA spaces are closed subspaces. Uh, then you know that duals from functional analysis are quotient spaces in the duals of LP. So the factor spaces in LQ. Now in applications, it's often useful to actually represent uh, the dual space as a space of functions rather than equivalence classes of functions. And so you find that uh, LPA has a dual LQ like you'd want it to be. And the proof is very simple now that uh, we know the um, boundedness of the Bergman projection. So it's clear that any LQA function defines a bounded linear functional on LPA just by the usual LP LQ duality. And if you have a um, functional on LP, 
then by the Hanbanov theorem, you can extend it to a functional on on the whole LP space of the same norm. So there's some function H in LQ, not necessarily analytic, that uh, represents this functional. And then you can take the Bergman projection of that function and you get a function G that's in this LQ space. And then you find that that's the function that works. Okay, so that, uh, that works for P between one and infinity. And uh, it doesn't work for P equals one because then we know the Bergman projection is not bounded. And I think Sheldon Exler in his talk will talk about the duality in case when P is equal to one. All right, so next topic that I want to talk about is uh, zero sets of uh, functions in these uh, Bergman spaces. So let's say you have a, a space of holomorphic functions in the disk, a Banach space or a Hilbert space. Then you say a sequence in the disk and you might have some points repeated here. It's called a zero set for the space of functions. If there is a function that is uh, equal to zero exactly at those points, and if a point has been repeated uh, several times, then uh, the derivative and second derivative and so on is also required to be zero, exactly up to the number of times that this point's been repeated in the sequence. So from the theory of analytic functions, you know that uh, if you have a zero set, then um, you can't have an accumulation point inside of the, the disk. So if, they, if you have infinitely many of these points, uh, they'll somehow have to converge to the boundary. So you call the sequence a Blaschke sequence if they converge to the boundary so fast that uh, the summation of one minus absolute lambda n is finite. And it's a theorem that uh, was mentioned in Tom's talk as well, that uh, for HP, for all HP spaces, P between zero and infinity, even equal infinity, uh, the zero sets of the HP spaces are exactly the Blaschke sequences. So if this expression is finite, then uh, you can form this Blaschke product here that I've written down at, at the bottom. And uh, that defines a function in H infinity with exactly uh, the zeros lambda n. And if you have a function in HP, uh, then it turns out that um, you can factor it as a product of a Blaschke factor times a function that has the same norm in HP. And, uh, and hence, uh, the sequence uh, has to be a Blaschke sequence. Because what's the connection between the Blaschke product and this Blaschke sum? Well, if you take the value of the Blaschke product at zero, you plug in z equals zero, you get uh, absolute lambda, uh, the product of the absolute lambda. So if you take the log of uh, that, the log of the product is a sum, and so you get the sum of one over the lambda n's, and uh, as the lambda n's converge to one, uh, I'm sorry, the log of the uh, one over lambda n's, and as that converges to one, that's approximately one minus lambda n. So the significance of the Blaschke sum here is that it uh, is related to the value of the Blaschke product at zero, and you need that to converge, otherwise um, this would be identically equal to zero. All right, if uh, you now go to the Bergman space, perhaps it's not a surprise there'll be a zero set for the Bergman space that's not a Blaschke sequence. The spaces are bigger, so uh, you get more functions, so perhaps that's... Uh, um, not too surprising. Horowitz shows that uh, the condition for Bergman uh, zero sets has to depend on the index. So when you have different indices, P and Q, then uh, the characterization of the zero sets for LP and LQ would have to give you something different. All right, so I have a proof here uh, of the part A of this result that there's a zero set for LP uh, that's not a zero set for for any of the HP spaces. So we take a function uh, of this type. We take a product of uh, 1 minus 2 z to the nk, where I'll choose the nk's in a moment. But uh, let's see, where, where are these functions equal to 0? So for, first of all, it's easy to show that uh, this product, uh, no matter what you choose for the nk, defines an analytic uh, function in the disk. So this uh, converges locally uniformly, this, this product here. And where are these equal to 0? Well. If you um, 
I claim the zeros are located on concentric circles and distributed like these red dots here. Um, let's go to the next page. Uh, so each factor is uh, of the type 1 minus 2 times z to the nk, and that's equal to 0 when z to the nk is equal to a half. And so the absolute value of uh, z to the nk is 1 half, so the z would have to be uh, 2 to the minus 1 over nk in absolute values. And then uh, you get the nth roots of unity uh, that go with the points on the circle there. So that's the red dots that I had uh, earlier. So you have a fixed radius, and then you have a corresponding number nk points on the corresponding circle. And then if you look at the contribution to the Blaschke sum, that was 1 minus absolute lambda nk, so you have nk points on each circle, and you have this expression 1 minus r, and that's uh, 1 minus 2 to the negative 1 over nk. Uh, you express that with an exponential function, so that we see that as nk goes to infinity, uh, the exponent goes to zero. And so this is like 1 minus the first uh, term in the power series for the exponential function, and so that's uh, uh, minus there with the second minus gives you a plus, the nk cancels out, and so that converges to log of 2, and as uh, you now take a sum of this uh, that's infinite, so it can't be a Blaschke uh, product, no matter what you choose for the nk's. All right, now how do we choose the nk's to get the function to be an LPA? Well, we inductively choose the nk's, so this is a product, so I call f sub m to be one of these partial products. Then fm plus 1 has one more factor, and if I now look at the norm of uh, m plus 1 in LP, let's say p is bigger than 1 again, we're having a triangle inequality there, so that's the norm of fm times 2 times z to the m plus 1 uh, times the norm of fm. So if you have the fm chosen, then you can choose the n sub m plus 1, uh, remembering that uh, this expression is an integral over the open disk, so this converges to zero. The fm is fixed. As uh, you let n go to infinity, this converges to zero. So you can make this term as small as you like, no matter what the fm is. So if you make that smaller than um, 1 over 2 to the m or something like that, that'll be summable in the end, then uh, you get that the sum of all the, uh, the terms is finite, and so you get the fms to be bounded. So it's a very simple argument that gives you that uh, such a function is in LPA and it doesn't satisfy the Blaschke condition. The functions that Horowitz uh, uses uh, are of the type, uh, some products like this, instead of the 2 he takes a b, and instead of the nk, which I, you know, chose arbitrarily here, uh, he chooses uh, m to the k, and then he varies the b and the m, and he gets uh, functions that are in lq and not in lp, or vice versa, in uh, the appropriate uh, cases. So that, of course, gets uh, more complicated. Now, if you believe what I just said, um, then uh, what Horowitz actually showed is that uh, these functions uh, that he considers there satisfy this condition that uh, when you look at the absolute values of their zeros, um, not only is the Blaschke condition violated, but when you divide the Blaschke, uh, the terms that you have in the Blaschke condition by this log of 1 over 1 minus n, so as n goes to infinity, the lambda n's go to the boundary, 1 over 1 minus lambda n goes to infinity, so does the log, so you make this term smaller, and even that's still infinite. And uh, again, why is that the case? Well, um, if you believe uh, these functions, you, that you can take these functions, we've already looked at the um, Blaschke condition, now you have a b in here, but that's the same, that will converge now to the log of b, and what happens in the bottom here is that the lambda n's are like b to the, absolute b to the minus 1 over mk, and uh, knowing that the log of uh, 1 minus z is, uh, is like the, the log of z, uh, you, um, you get this is sort of like a 1 over k, so you get a harmonic series here, which diverges. So all of these functions um, give you with something where this expression is finite. Uh, now Horowitz also showed that if you make this 
uh, denominator just a little bit uh, um, bigger, then the sum will always have to be finite. So if you have an LPA0 set, then for any epsilon, uh, the sum will have to be finite. And uh, notice now that um, even though we do know that uh, the LPA0 set condition doesn't need to depend on the index P, neither one of these two conditions does depend on P. So there's a whole lot of difference between these two conditions. All right, so Horowitz also showed uh, some other results about zero sets, namely that um, subsets of zero sets are always uh, zero sets for fixed index P. He showed that the union of L2, uh, two L2A zero set, LPA zero sets may not be an LPA zero set. Of course, if you take the, uh, the union of uh, two LPA zero sets, then you have uh, uh, LPA function U uh, that's zero on the first set and a LPA function V that's uh, zero on the second set and the product is a um, L2P, L LP over two A function um, and it's zero on, on the union of the two sets. Um, so, but uh, he actually showed that you cannot do better than, uh, than P over two uh, with the union of two LPA zero set. On the other hand, uh, the result I already mentioned that since the product of two uh, L2A functions is an, it gives you all the L1A functions, uh, the unions of uh, L2A zero sets is exactly the union of L1A zero sets. Um, Shapiro and Shields in the paper that uh, Tom also mentioned in early 60s uh, proved another type of uh, condition on the zero sets for the Bergman spaces. Namely, if you assume that all the zeros of uh, your Bergman function lie in a uh, non-tangential approach region, so I'll call that lambda c. The c here is a parameter that uh, tells me how, how wide the opening of this is, and then it's sort of ice cream cone uh, looking uh, region that's uh, uh, as a vertex at the point Z0, which is a point in the unit circle. If all your zeros lie in there, then um, the sequence will have to satisfy the Blaschke condition. And the proof of that result is, uh, is also very simple. So I'll prove it to you here at the point where Z0 is equal to 1. So there's your our ice cream cone. Um, and I'll uh, draw this auxiliary region, R, the blue circle. It's a circle centered at one half and um, radius one half, so it's tangent uh, at one. And uh, that's that circle, and it turns out it's uh, already mentioned by, by Tom, this is an orocyclic approach region at one, and so there's a small algebraic calculation that you can do that says that you can also represent this region by this condition, that the absolute value of one minus c quantity squared is strictly less than uh, one minus absolute value of z squared. And so we now consider the function uh, 1 minus z um, to the 4 over p power times f of z. So f is this function that has zeros at the points lambda n that all lie in this uh, non-tangential approach region. And our auxiliary function g now um, is this new function. And its absolute values in the region, in the blue region, uh, satisfies this inequality that uh, because the 1 minus absolute z squared is less than one minus uh, z absolute z squared um, is less than the f uh, and this to the two over p. And uh, then we have this estimate on the pointwise estimate on the LPA functions, which said this is always less than the norm of the function p. So that means that the function g is bounded in this region r. So now that means the zeros of the function g which are just some of the zeros of the function f. This extra factor here is not uh, never zero. Uh, so there's only finitely many zeros in, in the part uh, in the non-tangential approach region that are not in G, in, in, in R. And so that means the, um, the zeros of G will satisfy the Blaschke condition with respect to this new circle here. So for example, if the, the points lie on the radius, then uh, it's, it's very clear that uh, they'll have to uh, satisfy the Blaschke condition by themselves. But even if they don't lie on the radius, then uh, 
you can take the conformal map from this little disk, move it over one half unit, blow it up by a factor of two, and you get an analytic function in the disk. Um, the non-tangential approach region, that conformal map is just a linear map, so it takes this angle to another angle, so it doesn't change the fact that uh, if the lambda ends lie in the non-tangential approach regions, then the zeros of this new function uh, lie in some non-tangential approach region. And then you do just a calculation and it uh, tells you that the uh, Blaschke uh, sum of the lambda m's, uh, which by the reverse triangle inequality is less than one minus lambda n's in absolute values and uh, is bounded by the Blaschke expression that you get for the w n's. All right, so that's the proof of uh, the um, Shapiro and Shields result. And it, as a corollary, tells you that there can be no description of the LPA0 sets that only depends on the moduli. Because if you had such a condition, then uh, the moduli would have to uh, satisfy the Blaschke uh, condition, and we know that's, that's not the case. All right, now, then what can you do? All right, so if you look at this argument, of course, uh, it tells us that if you have uh, unions of finitely many uh, non-tangential approach region, then and uh, all the zeros lie in there, they have to satisfy uh, the Blaschke condition. Um, but now, of course, this Blaschke expression here gets bigger, and so if you let uh, want to take a union of infinitely many of these uh, 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 non-tangential approach region, then uh, you will need to do a quantitative version of this estimate. All right, when you do a quantitative version of this estimate, then remember what mattered somehow, what was related to the uh, the Blaschke expression was the value at zero of these functions. And that comes up in, in Jensen's formula that uh, you used to derive the uh, Blaschke um, expression also. Uh, so you need the value at zero of these functions. Well, the value at zero of, of the h is the value at one half of, uh, of this function g. And there you have the related to the function f that we started out with, we have this, this factor here. Um, one half to the four over p. And so as you start uh, wanting to do a, a quantitative uh, version of this argument, uh, what you, you find is that uh, you'd want to um, make sure that you, you do as well as you can in, in the power here, the four over p. And so you might want to take uh, a, not approach regions rather than, than circles that have uh, approach one, you may want to try uh, regions that have uh, ten 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 tangency that's between one and two, like uh, you take a power one plus epsilon or something like that. And that's what Horowitz did. And then he used some sort of uh, um, estimates on conformal mappings uh, that were known to, to get a, um, to get a um, quantitative version out of this. And, uh, and then uh, this was uh, improved uh, by SAPE uh, uh, later on. And what they came up with uh, is a condition that's uh, almost necessary and sufficient. And so what they do is, so let's take uh, the gamma C at a boundary point. So we take F to be a finite uh, subset of the unit circle. Um, and then we, for each of these points in F, we form this Stoltz region. That's the non-tangential approach region, the ice cream cone. And you take a union of these things, so you get what's called the Stoll star associated with this function f. And then you want to count all the zeros um, that are in this Stoll star. And then um, it turns out uh, when you do this quantitative uh, version, this uh, Carlson entropy uh, shows up. So you have this finite subset, you take the complementary arcs and you form uh, this expression here, which is related to uh, something that came up, came up in the definition of the Carlson thin sets uh, that uh, Tom was mentioning in his talks, um, that uh, comes up when you want to construct uh, analytic functions that are zero uh, on the set F and you want to have control on, on their certain norms of them. And uh, then as you take the ratio of, uh, of these things and take the limb soup as the 
uh, you take the finite sets going to infinity, the Carlson characteristic going to infinity, you call that the upper density. Now, because the stall star depends on the opening angle of the uh, non-tangential approach region, this expression appears to uh, depend on C, but um, in fact, uh, Kornblum shows it does not depend on C. And they show, Kornblum and SAPE show that, uh, in fact, if you have a sequence in the disk, and if the upper density is strictly less than 1 over P, then it is an LPA0 set. And conversely, if it is an LPA0 set, then the upper density has to be less than or equal to P. So the case that's open is when the upper density is equal to, to 1 over P. All right, now, in, uh, if you want to read about this, I, obviously, I, I, uh, this is, uh, is a difficult proof. In, in the book by um, Hinman, Kornblum, and Zhu, uh, they, they have a, a nice approach to this where they don't use this, uh, these things that I was talking about with the conformal mappings. They instead uh, use uh, estimates on, uh, on harmonic functions on, on these uh, um, approach regions there. And so, so it's a little bit easier than going back to the original papers when you read uh, the proof of this in the, bar in the book. But, um, but it's still a very complicated proof. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my, my first talk. Uh, okay, so uh, does anybody have any uh, questions? You can either put it in the chat and we'll try to keep uh, track of it, oh, but there are 123 of you, so maybe it's just easier if you just interrupt and sh shout out your question. Can I ask Bill my question? Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, Stefan, the, in the Dirichlet space setting, uh, there are uh, conditions based on the argument of Zn, which guarantees it's a sufficient condition, and the, and the argument which says that if this condition is satisfied, then it is a zero set. Do we have something similar in the Bergman space setting? Uh, well, there are, I mean, so, I, I didn't talk about uh, sampling sequences and interpolating sequences at all, but uh, there are some theorems that uh, say that if the zero set is uh, is um, somewhat more regularly distributed, uh, then uh, I mean, if the sequence is more regularly distributed, uh, so if they're um, if if they're uniformly separated, for example, then uh, there are simpler conditions. And, uh, and and that turn out to be necessary and sufficient, but uh, and just sort of in in general, um, I'm I'm not aware of this. Uh, Stefan, there are two questions in the chat. I don't know if you can. Okay, I can see the chat now. Um, is it possible to define Bergman's basis for compact surfaces like the the Riemann sphere? Um, uh, compact Riemann surfaces. Yes, you can, of course, define uh, any time you have a uh, have a measure, or you can define a weighted measure if you like on any space. And uh, I'm sure uh, I'm not aware of uh, actual results on this. Uh, uh, but uh, then uh, you'd want to uh, consider the Bergman kernel in these regions. Yeah. And there's one more question in the chat just above that. Yeah. So when the density is equal to one over p. As far as I know, uh, that is open. Um, so if something happened, uh, I was saying that uh, you know many papers in this last fifteen years or last two years even have been written. Uh, I think I might have heard about this, but uh, I'm not aware that uh, it's been solved. Okay. Uh why don't we take a five minute break uh, to get geared up for the next talk? Uh,